What do people think of the keynote? Or the Dries note? Yeah? Just, yeah. It's good to see some of the, the neat features that are, are part of, of, uh, of Drupal 8 and where that's going. And, and uh, yeah. Is it, does anyone know what, like, we're waiting for people to come in, so I'm just making ch chitter chatter at this point. But uh, the inline form errors, does anyone, does everyone know what that is? So it's an experimental module, and uh, you know, I do recommend that people enable it, despite Dries' uh, concerns about all uh, um, experimental modules being, uh, you know, not to be used in production. Uh, but, uh, but the, it's, it's an important part of, of accessibility if you have any interaction with your websites, because it's, it's something that's often overlooked, because it, you know, if a user is, is blind, uh, or has other disabilities and they, they're filling in a form, sometimes they don't know where the, what, what the error message, what errors are, are present on the page. And, and, uh, and it's, it's uh, you know, a lot of the, the testing that's done for accessibility overlooks the, um, the, error, the error screens because certainly the automated tests generally don't cover that and um, people often <coughs> overlook what happens if you provide bad data and, and produce a, an error message and how that's, that's intended to be presented. Um, so, uh, just again, just get a sense of the room. Um, how many people here would consider themselves beginners with accessibility? Just raise your hand. Okay. And what about people who are like seasoned experts? Do we have any seasoned experts? That carry? Okay. <laughs> so, so, Carrie, your talk is when again? Tomorrow. Is it tomorrow? Oh. That's right, that's right. So we'll talk a bit about that at the end. And uh, yeah, that's right. Um, and how many people here work for, for, um, for a government agency? This, you know, what about an educational institution like, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's understandable. Um, there, are there people here who work for, for uh, um, I guess, in the Drupal shops or agencies? Is there anyone else who doesn't fit in those three categories? Excellent. <laughs> it's a, certainly Section 508 really hits um, you know, that particular market. You know, the government and educational institutions are, are definitely the, the biggest, um, biggest sort of you know, demand uh, for, for that. Uh, there's lots of room up at the front over on this side, so feel free to come in. Um, is anyone here using Drupal 8 already? Nice. And uh, on production or just in, in a te te you know, development? Yeah, right now. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's definitely come a long ways with accessibility. There's, there's a lot that's been learned and a lot of, of neat stuff that's, that's happened, happened on that front. So, uh, yeah, nice to see that come along. Um, anyone here from, uh, from the Baltimore area? Yes, yeah. It's good to have a couple people who are local. It's, uh, yeah. How about people from D.C.? Yeah, it would make more sense if there's... <coughs> yeah. Is anyone spotted with a power? Oh, there's, there's one power outlet here if people need a power outlet that's, that's available. So, and there's more along the side here if people need to charge up their devices. I imagine there aren't any on that side, but, uh, you know, but there's certainly room on this side as well. If you want to sit down and... Were there people here at the uh, the summits uh, yesterday? And and uh, how many people participated in an accessibility discussion at a summit? <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it certainly came up a number of times in in both the the nonprofit summit as well as the uh, the government summit. Um, there wasn't a higher ed summit this year, this year, was there? Yeah, there was. Was it brought up in there as well? Um, in quick conversation, but I don't think they actually had a topic. Right. Right. I think we're mostly here at this point. I imagine there'll be a few people dropping, coming in as the as the coffee lines get smaller. But 
that's all fine. Um, just give them a moment to show up. Is anyone here not from the United States? Like, yeah, so, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting topic for you know, because Section 508 is, is such an American law and, and uh, it's, it's, a, uh, um, it's something that, that uh, back in 2000 may have made a lot more sense to sort of see as, a, you know, as an early template for, for uh, um, you know, other, other organizations and countries. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's definitely a totally American thing that uh, is fortunately changing. Okay, I think we can now officially officially begin because it's 10:45. So um, my name is Mike Gifford, and I'm the president of Open Concept Consulting, and uh, we're based in Ottawa, Canada. Uh, I propose this su the subject because of being been looking down and, and looking at various different uh, types of, of accessibility legislation that are, are going down. Um, you know, around the world, but uh, but also uh, in the states, and think that there's a, a lot of eyes are, are watching what's happening uh, in the U.S. for for many reasons, and certainly the uh, so many businesses and industries are, are based in the U.S. and, and it's, it's being such a, a leader internationally with the internet. Um, but I thought that there was a, a good opportunity to go off and to, to talk about about the subject and, and to put so put a bit of it in context, to provide provide a bit more clarity for the. Um, for the, the Drupal community. Um, so my company is Open Concept Consulting um, and we, we, uh, we work uh, with, we're a Drupal shop. Uh, we do accessibility work, but not exclusively, uh, um, not ex exclusively accessibility and not exclusively Drupal. Uh, we, we work with governments and nonprofits and educational institutions and uh, work to try and, and build a more collaborative open society. We're heavily involved in, in supporting uh, the Drupal community, particularly the accessibility initiatives uh, I'm a Drupal 8 core accessibility maintainer, but, uh, but there's also um, maintainers who are, uh, or they're, they're, sorry, they're, uh, but I'm also involved in, in, uh, in trying to go off and promote uh, the adoption of open source in government and, and even changes in, in procurement policies so that there's, um, so it's easier for organizations to be able to, to get involved in the open source community and, and start doing things uh, better and, and uh, by, by collaborating with open source tools. Um, so everyone knows what Section 508 is, right? So this is the legislation to try and, and verify that, that people can can access the internet. It was, um, and, and it's it's uh, put up by the the, uh, the U.S. government, and, and there's a lot of organizations that that uh, need to follow the the uh, uh, the Section 50, 508 guidelines. But there's a whole bunch of other players that are in the in the scene that are looking at at this this specific issue. So. Uh, the World Wide Web Consortium is one, and they're the leading experts in this and trying to, to try and uh, build standards and build um, a, a framework for, uh, for accessibility and, and, and for the web, really to sort of cement that, that, that framework for, for, uh, for how the internet and how the, the web is, is, is working. Um, there's also the, the Web Accessibility Initiative. So this is a small team of people that, that work on trying to uh, to work specifically on accessibility issues, uh, and there's subgroups within that. There's uh, WCAG, which we'll talk about briefly. There's ATAG. There's uh, UTAG. There's there's a, a bunch of of, um, of groups that are looking at various elements of, of improving the the uh, uh, the the process for for managing um, managing standards. And and, and uh, how many people here have tried to go off and build a collaborative standard with anyone? Just, you know, it's a long and painful process. So anyone who's involved in, in sort of creating and engaging with that legislation needs a, a great deal of respect because it's, it's a, it takes a, a lot of patience to, to manage that. Um, in the US, there's a, a number of other uh, organizations that, that are, are specifically looking at, um, <coughs> at, at, at the accessibility legislation. Um, there's the uh, Architectural and Transport Barriers Compliance Board, or the Access Board. Uh, there's the Department of Labor. The Equality and Employment Opportunity Commission, the Department of Transportation, the FCC, and the Department of Justice. Um, there's also um, accessibility legislation that's that's applied at, at many state, county, and municipal uh, levels of, of government. So it's, it's something that that um, that affects a lot of a lot of people, and a lot of different organizations trying to, to deal with how how to, to, to structure this. Um, 
I thought it was useful to go off and to t talk a bit about the, the history of, of, uh, of, you know, of accessibility, uh, particularly with web accessibility, because this is something that, that people often forget that, that these, these pieces of legislation are, are they, come, they don't come out of nowhere. They're part of a, a, a disc, um, an effort to try and provide more equity and justice and to really um, provide opportunities for, for more, more people to be engaged in society. And so, um, the you know the first effort to, to try and look at at uh, you know, to form the accessibility board was done in 1973. Um, the initial section 508 uh, was was set up in, in 1986, um, and then in 1990 there was the Americans with a Disability Act, um, and that was that was so you know, at that time the United States was really quite forward looking. This is whoops, that's not useful. <laughs> Uh, in 1997, we had the, the formation of the World Wide Web Consortium's uh, Web Accessibility Initiative. Um, it wasn't until uh, 1999 that the World Wide Web Consortium launched uh, WK 1.0. Uh, and uh, you know, we had, uh, in, in 1998, sec the Section 508 Amendment. This was the amendment that, that dealt with uh, web accessibility, because back in uh, 1986, they hadn't really thought about how to deal with that and how to manage that technology. Uh, 2001, um, it, you know, it was, Section 508 was, was implemented in 1998, but wasn't actually enforced until um, till 2001. Um, and uh, then, you know, in 2008, we had the uh, WK 2.0 came out. Uh, and then there's, there's ATAG came out just uh, in 2015. ATAG is the Authoring Tool Accessibility Guideline. Uh, there's also January of this year we had the, uh, the, the Section 508 refresh process that, that, that was, was signed in by Obama. Um, we'll see what actually happens with that because it's, it's something that, um, yeah, I think that there still are some possibilities that Trump might find a way to, to pull that back. Uh, but don't worry, you're, there will be still information here that, that will be relevant in this talk, even if Trump is able to go off and to, to do some um, legal jujitsu to go off and to pull out this great piece of legislation that's taken over a decade to go off and to get, you know, revised and brought into to, uh, uh, to power. Um, this year there was also the WK 2.1 draft release, um, so that's again a standard that's evolving and changing. Um, and uh, you know, next year, January 18th, is the expected compliance date for WK 2.0 AA for, for American organizations. So the, the, the guidelines from 1997 that the, or sorry, 1998 that, that the uh, US, uh, the Department of, uh, the, sorry, the Access Board went off and implemented will be, uh, will be finally updated in, in January of 2018 if, if all goes as planned. Um, and it, it took a, a long time to get to that point, but, but it's, it's something that, that uh, um, hopefully, will hopefully bring the U.S. up to, to speed with, with the rest of, of the modern world. Um, so I also want to put in context what else is happening with, with the web and how the web has changed. So um, how many people here were developing websites in 1995? Like, that was a long time ago. It's changed so much since then. Um, and, and we have, uh, you know, again, with, with security, we had SSL implementation, implemented um, in 19, uh, sorry, SSL 3.0 was implemented in 1996. Uh, we had, uh, you know, 1998, which is a, this, the same year that the Section 508 was implemented. We were just dealing with the, the release of CSS 2.0. Uh, again, 1999, we had the implementation of HTML 4.1, 4.01. Uh, 4 uh, SVG, RDF, uh, you know, TSL, security layers, RDFA, like a lot of these technologies are, are, are changing and evolving over time because, because the industry is, 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 you know, finding ways to go off and, and uh, to meet the needs of consumers and to, to create more dynamic, uh, in inclusive uh, um, technologies. Um, the, uh, I wanted to highlight the, the web uh, area standard, the, rich, uh, the accessible rich internet um, applications. This was a standard that we were looking at in Drupal 7. So when Drupal 7 was, was, was released, I forget exactly when that was, but we, you know, area wasn't a, a formalized standard at that point. So when we were looking at building uh, Drupal 7 and uh, the, the core of Drupal 7, we couldn't really include that much area because we weren't sure where it was going to change and how those, those standards were going to be, be modified. Um, but uh, when it was implemented as a, as a final uh, recommendation in 2014, 
um, we, we felt that it was, was fine to go off and bring area into uh, the, the uh, uh, you know, Drupal 8 core and have that be something that, that we try and build in by default into uh, the practices of, of, uh, of core development. Um, is everyone here familiar with what area is and how it works? No. Okay, so area is it's a, essentially a way of adding additional semantics to, a, uh, to the website to give meaning about what that, that piece of functionality is intended to do. It uh, has a bunch of I information like um, landmarks that, that allow you to define different regions of the text that, that um, are useful to go off and to say if you want to get to the search engine or if you want to get to navigation or you want to get down to the footer. Um, it's, it's broken down that way. Um, it's also uh, structured in a way that allows you to deal with, with changes in the text. So if there's um, it, Area Live was, was implemented that allows, if, if, there's, if there's content that's dynamically changed on the page, then it alerts you to say that this content is dynamically being updated. Um, we also had the, the implementation of, uh, of you know, uh, HTML5 and, and uh, most recently HTML5.1 is being, being worked on as well. So there's, you know, all of these standards are being updated and changed over time. So in the U.S., a lot of the legislation around Section 508 came out of the, the Rehabilitation Act in an effort to try and support veterans. Um, it's, it's uh, you know, again, going back to the very beginning of this, this is looking at, at uh, efforts to support uh, people who are veterans who are returning from World War I uh, and, and trying to go off and, and support people who, um, I mean, certainly they weren't using the web in, in, uh, you know, in, 19, uh, in 1917, but, uh, but you were having people who were injured through war who needed to be able to try and find a way to live, to make their living back in the U.S. after, after serving their country. Um, and uh, it's come, a lot of the language and whatnot is, has come from that. Um, and and uh, Section 508 was, was implemented um, when, the, when the web was still quite young, and they, they used a lot of, of technical, um, they added technical elements that made it very uh, specific for the, the technology of the day. It wasn't a very future-proof uh, set of regulations because they were looking at, at what, what the screen readers could do and what was available back in, uh, well, probably was initially drafted in, in uh, 95, 96, 97, uh, but actually came into implement, implementation in 98, as I said. Um, and uh, you know, Section 508 is really important for any organization that is receiving federal funds or is under contract with a federal agency. So that's a lot of, of different organizations. Um, whereas um, the Americans with Disability Act uh, really comes from a perspective of, of civil rights. So it's, it's a similar perspective, but it's, it's, it's slightly different language and slightly different history in terms of how this, this came about. Um, so you know, we're not looking specifically at, at the Americans with the Disability Act in this discussion, but, um, but both, the, um, about, both Section 508 and the Americans with Disability Act uh, are moving to, to use the international standard of WK 2.0 AA as, as, the, um, as the guideline for whether or not something is accessible or not. So uh, if we're looking um, at, uh, you know, Section 504 actually is, is, is looking at, at supporting civil rights uh, for people with disabilities and, and trying to make sure that you, you're, you are allowing for reasonable accommodations. Uh, the Americans with Disability Act is broken down into a couple different sections um, and, and it's, it's uh, trying to go off and, and to deal with anyone that's serving programs or services or, or uh, activities for, for people with disabilities. Um, the language, like I'm, I'm not a lawyer and not a policy wonk, but, but uh, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> that was nicely timed. <laughs> <laughs> So the, uh, um, you know, trying to go up and make sure that you're, you're dealing with effective communication, that, that the, if you're communicating to somebody with a disability, they're not getting a, an inferior experience. They're able to have an, a, an effective, as, as effective communications as possible as you'd have with, with others. Um, so yeah, if you're, if you're looking at, at uh, most of you probably already know this, but it, you're, you're underneath Section 508 if you receive federal funding or if you're under contract with a federal agency. So anyone who's, who's got contracts with the federal government uh, as an agency or if you get money from, from a federal government agency, you, you are probably uh, responsible for, for, for meeting the Section 508 guidelines, which will change in January. Um, so the, the ADA, on the other hand, is, is, is broader, and um, it includes most 
most places of lodging um, and recreation, sports, education, stores, restaurants, uh, transportation. Um, there's a new bill that I, I didn't actually uh, list this, but there's a new bill about airline transportation and trying to go off and support uh, more accessible airline transportation. And that, there's a part of that was looking at, at the, the websites uh, and, and trying to make sure that websites, if, like the, the people who, are, who have disabilities can effectively book, book flights on airlines. Um, a lot of uh, websites, uh, airline websites are particularly, or have been particularly bad for accessibility. Uh, so that's, that's definitely something. Um, it, it basically includes almost every organization um, except for private clubs and religious organizations. So, um, and you know, certainly religious organizations should be thinking about this if only to try and make sure that their members are able to go off and um, access the, uh, the resources, um, or not the resources, the, the, uh, to, to participate in, in the, the, the community. Um, but they're not legally uh, responsible to go off and, and to meet the ADA requirements. Um, so has anyone here um, either been involved in a suit or a, um, you know, yeah, about accessibility? There's a few people. Um, fortunately, I haven't actually been involved in any of those, but uh, any time you're, you're dealing with, with a, uh, um, uh, yeah, a conflict in court, it's, it's a painful process for everyone involved. Uh, and uh, we all know that, that web developers are, are even if you're good web, de web developers are, are not as expensive as lawyers, so it's, uh, <laughs> it's something that, that uh, it's important to try and, and, uh, and think about when, within organizations and, and hopefully, um, hopefully we'll be able to go off and have, have more people be actively looking at, at improving their site's web, uh, web accessibility as opposed to having, having individuals go off and, and, and sue organizations because their, their organization isn't accessible. Um, unfortunately, that's the, the U.S. has chosen an enforcement mechanism which is entirely based on personal uh, lawsuits. So, um, whether it's the the NFB uh, suing organizations like they did Target, uh, they sued Target a few years back for six million dollars. Um, and you know, it's it's interesting to see how Target has really turned things around, and they've 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 tried to go off and take a, a real leadership role and sort of own the mistakes that they've made. Uh, I was at CSUN, which is a big uh, accessibility conference in uh, San Diego, uh, this was two or three years ago, and there was a team of, of about, I think it was almost 10 people from Target who came down for that conference to both learn but also to present on, on what they're doing on, on, uh, on sort of taking this message, message to heart and finding ways to be able to, uh, to more effectively build their website to, to, uh, to meet to be more inclusive and meet more more needs of of, uh, of citizens. Uh, so, do you know what exactly your specific needs were? Uh, yes. Not at this. No, I don't. Unfortunately, yeah. And it's this, at this point, there's probably archives uh, somewhere yeah. what the, that would be. But but it, uh, yeah, I don't know specifically what the problems were. Um, I, I do find it ridiculous that uh, that the the um, um, that it was. Uh, George W. Bush went off and, and uh, um, was, was the, the, the president who came down and, and uh, was, has, has actually, you know, he has, he's quoted as saying, let the shameful wall of exclusion finally come tumbling down. And, and he put forward a call to go off and to, to help, um, you know, encourage accessibility and, and to, to, to try and push ahead uh, on web accessibility. And up until uh, till Obama went off and, and, and made um, made this this uh, this pro or, uh, re did, adopted the Section 508 refresh. I think that uh, George W. Bush had probably done the most to try and push push ahead uh, web accessibility on a federal level of, of uh, well yeah of, of any he was the last president to make a big impact on this. Um, we'll see what happens with Trump, but uh, he again it's, it's, there's there's uh, there's hopeful that there's being push on on both Republican and Democrat sides on this. Um, so. Uh, yeah. The the uh, uh, now the other thing about private uh, legislate or sorry about lawsuits is that um, if your organization is sued by an individual because your website is not accessible, uh, the Department of Justice is being very clear that um, you can get sued more than one time for not having your website be acce accessible. So you know, you're not just dealing with a single lawsuit and what you can settle with an individual because you've blocked their uh, their their ability to go off and engage with their website. You're you're potentially dealing with multiple multiple lawsuits, uh, which is uh, a much more expensive thing to, to deal with. Um, so, a couple of the differences uh, between Section 508 and um, and WCAG 2.0. Um, 
Um, Section 508 was, was really focused on the technology, so um, it was all built around HTML, and uh, you know, the, the goal is you know, don't use JavaScript. JavaScript is, is, is bad, and, and so there's still people who will say, for accessibility, you should go off and, and be able to turn off the JavaScript. Um, I'm happy to say that that's no longer the case, that, that you don't need to disable your JavaScript for accessibility. You might want to test your, your website uh, without JavaScript if you're worried about security issues. Uh, that's something that, that uh, people who are, are particularly worried about security might want to be able to run your website without JavaScript. But everyone else is, it works on the document object model, the DOM, so there's no need to disable the, the, uh, the JavaScript for, for screen readers. Um, WK 2.0, on the other hand, was built on principles. So it's perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust, um, which are, are just very forward-thinking uh, elements to try and make sure, you know, can somebody read the material? Can they, can they be able to engage with it and, and make changes and fill in a web form? Uh, can they understand it? Is it written in a way that, that makes sense to people? And also, is it something that is, is, uh, is robust enough that, that you can deal with older technology and newer technology and look at it in different devices and even look at it in spaces that, that uh, maybe you want to go off and, and uh, look on your phone outside and try and be able to, to access the information in a different context. Um, WCAG also includes um, aspirational elements. Um, it's, uh, it's something that um, WCAG uh, has three different levels. There's single A, double A, and triple A. Um, the single A is, is, is basically filled with fairly easy things to implement and, and things that, that are really, really low hanging fruit. Double A is, 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 is definitely a, a harder standard to meet, but it's the standard that um, everyone is putting into legislation and putting into their, their goals for, for accessibility. It's the goal we built Drupal 7 to, uh, not that we met it completely, but we're, our goal was to try and, and implement uh, Drupal 7 core with uh, WK 2.0 uh, AA standards, and we carried that forward in Drupal 8 and found ways to improve, improve on what we did in Drupal 7 and make, make Drupal 8 more robust and more accessible. Um, but there's, there's aspirational elements too, in, in that AAA is, is designed for, for, um, for dis disabilities that are harder to go off and, and to, to deal with. So cognitive, dif uh, cognitive disabilities are, are more difficult. Um, trying to go off and, and if you have a particular community, like um, if you're serving the, the, uh, the, the deaf-blind community, or if you're serving uh, seniors who might have multiple disabilities, or um, even if you're an organization like the Parkinson's Foundation that has a specific disability that they're focused on, but also know that their members have other disabilities as, as well as that, and how do you try and deal with, with, with those, those kinds of changes? Um, dealing with people who are, are, are managing um, um, English as a second language is, is again, something that, that, uh, that's a bit of a challenge sometimes, because it's, it's uh, um, people don't necessarily, if, if things are not written in plain language, then things are, are much harder to be able to, to understand for, for other people. Um, now, um, here's the, the easy part of, you know, what, what you, if you, how many people here are really familiar with Section 508? Okay. Um, how many people are more familiar with WCAG and WCAG standards than 508? Okay, that's um, the, the, uh, the, we've sort of listed out some comparison items to sort of say what is equi essentially equivalent. So um, I'm not going to go through this in, in any depth and, and there's a, a lot of text in these slides so I don't want to go off and, and, and you know, drill through each individual one. Um, but a lot of these, these elements are, everything I've bolded is, is a, a single A requirement. Um, and uh, one of the ones that's, that's uh, actually one of the hardest is still dealing with non-text content. So um, it's providing um, text for images or for graphs or for maps, trying to go off and provide a textual equivalent for everything, that, uh, everything on your website. Um, and and that's, that's a, you know, that, yeah, it's, it's, it's a difficult one for organizations to, to do correctly. One thing we've done in Drupal 8 that makes that a lot easier is that by default we're requiring that, um, that websites are, the, all text is required by, by default in Drupal 8. Not that it's the, the, um, the only place that, uh, you, you can disable that, and there's some places where you don't actually want to have alt text, uh, but, in, but by default we wanted to make it easier to go off and add alt text for content editors than to skip it and just sort of hope that somebody else will go off and address it later. Uh, so changing those, those patterns. Um, 
The use of color is another one, trying to go off and make sure that you're not using color as the only way to convey symbols. Um, and uh, you, can, you can take a look at, at these comparisons. And there's, there's a great table that I include um, at, the, uh, at the end of the, the slide that this sort of illustrates what, what isn't and what isn't involved in, in, uh, uh, in these two different sets of, of guidelines. Um, you also don't have to worry about other things like uh, uh, keyboard navigation. That should be you know, largely taken care of. The ability to pause and, and uh, uh, stop and play your video recordings. Um, the, uh, you know, trying to, to uh, uh, make sure there's a page title on your website. Um, making sure that the focus of your web page is visible so that if somebody's tabbing through the website that they, they know where they are. Um, again, you know, there's, there's a, a bunch of things that, that are are things that, that you will have, if you've already been looking at it, at building your website for Section 508, you're going to, to know how to, to do for WCAG 2.0. Um, but it's not the same. There's a bunch of, of items that are, are going to be, be new for you as well that, that I'll try and, and, and uh, focus on a bit more. Uh, again, there's lots and lots of documentation on this in the W3 webs uh, W3C's website um, and, and lots of explanations about how these, these different elements work. Um, but one of the things that's, that's different is, is providing a meaningful sequence. Um, so being able to, as you're tabbing through a website, if you're using a keyboard to go off and navigate through the site or using a screen reader to navigate through the site, it should follow a logical order, a logical order that, that a, a sighted person would, would be able to follow. So in, if you're dealing with, with uh, European-based uh, languages, you know, going from, from the top left to the bottom right, um, in terms of order of, of priority and, and having things structured in a way that, that allows people to consistently navigate them. Um, making sure that, that uh, you're, you're uh, providing um, information that, that, that's not just, uh, just textual, to be able to, to convey um, instructions, or to not convey in, in instructions that are only done through, through a shape, that you're providing text as well, uh, that you have uh, more audio controls, uh, that you have a, a minimum color contrast between uh, between your 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 your, uh, your web page, or your your lightest color and your darkest color, and I'm, I'm always amazed at how how hard how hard it seems to be for organizations to get color contrast right. It's really not that difficult. Like there's all kinds of simple tools that allow you to go off and evaluate it, and and you know so many times it's 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 um, it goes up to the the organization style guide that they've they've you know. Uh, hired some some you know a hot designer that went off and created this this style guide with lots of grays in it and 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 it's it's like well some of these issues just need to be fixed right up at the very top of the organizations to see that they can trickle down and make sure that those those initial um, slate of colors are 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 ones that that are are, are able to go off and and and, and really strongly um, meet those color contrast requirements. Um, and uh, yeah, um, resizing text is another one that's, that's added in here. Um, you need to be able to increase the, the size of your text 200%. Um, and and that's, that can be done either through one of those text resizing widgets or by using control plus. Um, con using control plus uh, or minus to control the screen size is actually a better way than, than using the widgets because it, it takes advantage of the, um, the ability of the browser to go off and, and effectively manipulate the screen. So, um, but it, it's, it requires you know, education about the users and it's not necessarily as discoverable for, for some, some users. Um, in terms of operable, um, we want to make sure that, uh, that there's no keyboard traps. It's, it's uh, again, more, as you're dealing with more complicated websites, you're more likely to have spaces where, where when you're navigating through the site, your, your information will get, or you're, you may not be able to get out of the, the, uh, the dialogue that you're in. Um, that, uh, that there's the ability to provide a, uh, you know, a easy way to go off and navigate uh, predictably through, uh, through web forms and, and manage that focus order. Um, the importance of, of link purpose. Um, uh, how many people still have uh, links on the bottom of their website that says read me? Yeah. <laughs> or click here? Like th these are, are not particularly useful and, and something we've done in, in, uh, in Drupal is that for a lot of these forms where we've, we've, um, we've, we have that text, we also have, um, if you look at the page source, um, we have in an invisible span something that says read more about title of article. So you can, you don't see it visually, 
um, but the, if, if you're using the, navigating the, the website through a screen reader or if you're Google or some other bot that, that is trying to go off and scrape information, you can get the full context of what that link is about um, within, within the context of the link without actually cluttering up the visual look of the, the website. Um, 2.4.5 is looking at multiple ways to locate information, sort of like having a search button and having a site map on, the, on your website as well as your site navigation. That's a, a nice way to go off and to, to duplicate that. Uh, and also having headings and labels on, on all of your content. Um, Drupal 7 and Drupal 8 have, have come with, with um, um, headings and over the blocks and, and uh, a lot of, of headings have been added into the structure. A lot of times those headings are, are again, they're, they're listed as, they're invisible headings, so you can't actually see them, um, but they're there to go off and provide screen readers context and, and uh, generally screen readers tend to, to use headings um, like uh, stones to cross a river. It's like, you know, abilities to get an understanding and to get a, a navigational sense of how, how a site is constructed. Um, Understandable. Um, this is a big one that's that's also um, missed from a lot of organizations. Um, just trying to understand, like even even language issues. Um, so, uh, trying to make sure that that you're exposing the language that t the text is written in. Um, and uh, in the the uh, the U.S., there's an assumption that that everything is in English, and that's not a good assumption. Um, and so, making sure that you've you've added a header that that at the very beginning of the page states what. Uh, what the page is is uh, is is written in, and, and what the default should be for the screen reader. Um, screen readers, if they come across a phrase like "je ne sais quoi," are not quite um, smart enough to realize that that's supposed to be French and try and do that in French. They'll just instead garble it with an English version, and it'll sound nasty. Whereas if you can um, if you can define um, what that small section of text is, if you're switching languages uh, and providing that that other context, you can you can make it easier for for the screen readers to pronounce that text properly. Um, the uh, uh, error suggestions, another one, and error prevention, trying to make sure that, that the, um, that it's, that text is being, if people are filling in a form, that that, that, uh, that errors are, are caught earlier and that there's an easier way for people to know what the, uh, the problems are and to be able to help guide users to the process of filling in forms and providing information. Um, we work really, really hard to try and, and get inline form errors into core in uh, Drupal 8 and an 8.0 release. Um, and it was briefly, it was briefly in core for about um, maybe a week before re we realized that it affected so many other pieces of the API and it had to be brought out and put in as an experimental module. Uh, and it's, it's really great to go off and see that, that uh, Dries gave it so much cover, cover and that, that, uh, um, that there's people who are standing up to, to, to now be you know, the inline form errors uh, maintainer, but, um, but we, you know, errors are an important part of the process and part of making sure that, that your websites are, are accessible to people with disabilities and, and uh, with the inline form errors module you can, you can do that. You can make it much easier for, for everyone to be able to understand what the problems are on the website. Um, robust is, a, is another one that, that uh, um, is useful. Trying to go off and see that, that your, your HTML is, is formed properly and that, that there aren't errors in the code. Um, the, the other one that, that I, I haven't actually seen in the, the WK standards, but is very much related to this and should fit in, is just spelling mistakes. Um, it's, it's, a, it's amazing how, how, like, how do we expect screen readers, readers to be able to pronounce words that are misspelled? Um, and uh, you know, trying to make sure that somebody who's trying to go off and navigate a website from with a, if English is their second language, how do they do that if they, if, if words, if they can't look up a word in the dictionary because, you know, it doesn't exist. Um, I remember one of the, the issues I was, was involved in for, for a while was, was actually fixing spelling errors in the, the comments and the code in, in Drupal because there were a whole bunch of them that, that had just sort of been brought into core. People had overlooked the spelling, uh, spelling issues of, of various different problems and we, we've wanted to try and make sure that Drupal was inclusive it's as inclusive as possible so that somebody who's blind can be a, uh, a developer as well as a an editor and a user and, and a, you know not not just just somebody that's stuck in a, a consumer role but really you know, to have the possibility of a, a producer uh, producer opportunity uh, to be a producer um, and uh, the other thing is is, is dealing with with uh, uh, 
you know, dealing with a range of technologies. Um, there's, a, there's a real problem with how screen readers are, and support for screen readers is, is supported in, uh, and other assistive technologies as well in, in most countries. Um, generally, what happens is that there's state-supported funding for people to buy products like JAWS, um, and uh, that there's actually a disincentive for, for people to go off and buy um, apples or uh, even to, to use open source tools like NVDA. Um, there's a lot of government money that goes to Freedom Scientific and other you know, companies who are building proprietary products to serve, uh, serve people with, with disabilities. But it means that often people only have screen readers that are, are, were, were updated you know, three or four years ago. And if you're dealing with that old technology, if you can't assume that the technology is being updated on a regular basis and that, that you, can, you can build to the last two releases, it's a real challenge to try and how do you support such a, a broad range of, of, uh, of users. Um, I've included two links here. Uh, one is, is the uh, alphabet of accessibility issues, and uh, it's, it's too long a link to go off and to, um, to actually put it into the, um, the, the screen there, but it's, it's, uh, it's a nice sort of comparison to try, try and think about people who have disabilities in, in a number of different contexts. We, we often think of, of people who are blind, but that's a very small, minute use case. It's much more useful to try and, and think about the 10 to 20% of the population who uh, might, might have other disabilities, but also people who are temporarily disabled, people who, you know, you've got a Band-Aid on your finger and you can no longer, you're having trouble navigating your phone with your left hand or something like that. Like, there's, there's all kinds of ways that, that uh, you know, people ha are on medications or they're suddenly getting a new prescription and, and things are, are, are harder for them to see for a temporary period of time. They wouldn't call themselves disabled, uh, but they, they're having the same uh, challenges or they're reaching the same barriers that so many other people are. Um, so I want to say that, that the, the uh, um, moving towards a uh, towards WK 2.0 AA is a really good thing. It will actually save time and money for everyone because this is an international standard that everyone is dealing with. And um, many organizations like Drupal have already adopted the international standard. Uh, so um, how many organizations here are, are already, uh, have already adopted and embraced WK 2.0 standards? So it's a few. I mean, there's, there's uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it, it does take a bunch of, ch of internal changes to go off and to, to modify the wording and try and make sure that people understand the differences between them, but, but there's... Aspirational. Yeah, yeah. Or a lawsuit. A lawsuit would do it too, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah hopefully there are not, hopefully there aren't that many of those in this room who, who are, have been sued. There are a couple who are involved in lawsuits, but uh, yeah. Um, WK will also go off and make sure that your, your websites are more future compatible. Um, it's, it's, it's a move ahead and, and as I tried to illustrate earlier, these technologies are keeping, to, keeping changing and, and, and the expectation that we accommodate other people is, is, is increasing um, internationally. It's not just here in the United States, but it's everywhere in every modern democracy. Uh, so much of our society is being served up through electronic medium. Um, you can't just exclude you know, 10 to 20 percent of the population and, and expect to be a modern democracy or to be a, uh, to successfully, to be a successful educational institution if you're, if you're not building your site to be, to be inclusive. Um, and uh, um, it's, it's, it's also, um, you know, because the U.S. is, is, a, is a late adopter to WK 2.0, um, it's also nice to go off and, and to, to remember that there's, there's a lot of documentation that's available now that you can take advantage of. Uh, and one of them that they've been coming up with recently is, is, uh, is some tutorials uh, to try and make it easier to, to go off and learn and adopt these technologies. So it's, it's uh, the, the WK standards are, in, like any standards driven policy is really boring and long and it's, it's great, you know, if you, it's great material to read if you need to go to sleep. Um, but, I mean, it's, it's, it's really important, but it's, it's not written for readability and I think that the, the understand, understandability component of WCAG is lost on the, the, the WCAG 2.0 uh, guidelines because they're, they're really written for academics and policy geeks and, and the tutorials have, are a way to try and bring that down, bring, bring that to a more, more web developer friendly kind of, uh, of language. So there's a link to the uh, W3C's tutorials there. 
Um, unfortunately, there's more to be done. Um, this is not a, an easy topic. Accessibility is a, it's a real challenge to try and, and to keep up with. There's never going to be a website that is 100% accessible. Um, the, the web is changing so quickly that we, we need to be able to keep uh, updating our tools and technology to keep up with that. Our expectations are, are changing. Um, just little things like even, even when WK 2.0 was, was released in, in 2008, was, was Google Docs even around then in 2008? Like, there's things that we sort of have incorporated into our, our just way of working that, that it's hard to imagine what, what the world would be like without Google Docs, uh, just in terms of collaboration and whatnot. And yet, these frameworks and policies didn't have that ability to go off and to, to have that understanding of how we would operate and work with the web. Um, mobile devices are definitely uh, a problem, and there's, there's actually some increasing work to look at how to deal with virtual reality, and if we're going to be you know, immersing ourselves in, in uh, virtual reality headsets, how do we try and make sure that that's uh, as inclusive as possible, particularly for people with visual impairments. Um, the, um, it's a real challenge to deal with assistive technology, because there's a whole bunch of different, um, different technologies out there, and they tend to, um, to be like, um, it's, it's like the browser wars of the early, uh, the early 90s, you know, best best viewed with with uh, uh, Mozilla or with uh, sorry, best used with Netscape and and, uh, and whatnot. So, you know, there's there's sites that are designed for particular um, assistive technology devices or tested on certain assist assistive technology devices, but you know, VoiceOver and Freedom Scientific and NVDA and um, and and uh, the other one, there's 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 a whole bunch of other ones. They don't necessarily follow the same patterns and expectations and. And they change them from time to time. Uh, in the Drupal 7 release cycle, we had a, a solution for um, CSS display none that that we had to change because uh, Google went and, or sorry, uh, Apple went and changed uh, how VoiceOver worked, and we had to respond to that and make those changes and modifications. Um, likewise, the uh, CSS standards are changing, and so now there's a, a move to try and remove Clip because Clip is, is no longer going to be supported in CSS officially. So the solution we're, we're coming up with with CSS Display None uses Clip. So we need to try and find a new solution that, that isn't relying on this, this uh, CSS uh, standard that's no longer supported. Um, so um, there's other challenges that uh, you know, people interpret WK differently. There are guidelines that, that um, that are fairly clearly written, but there's different ways that they're interpreted in different spaces. So the U.S. is going to have to, to determine how they're going to, to look at adopting this and what, what are the elements that, that are going to be sort of commonplace uh, for that, especially when it comes to, uh, to, to, to lawsuits. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a real challenge when, when, uh, the, um, when you're looking at, at web accessibility, one of the other challenges is how people claim that their websites are uh, claim that they're accessible, like the, the, the claims that, that web developer developers make about accessibility and their ability to go off and to make websites accessible, and the the claims that organizations make about the accessibility of their websites. I mean, it's a it's a real challenge, and people people often forget that this is a journey and not a destination. So it's not something you're you're ever going to be completely over it with, and, and that there's there's so much to learn, there's so much to to understand about how how we perceive and, and interact with with the world and with the with the internet. Um, the uh, WK only uh, also deals with with part of the problem. Um, so we have uh, the authoring tools accessibility guideline, which I touched on briefly before, but. But so many organizations, particularly larger institutions, have people who are, are writing content um, who don't necessarily have the expertise to, to be able to create accessible content. So uh, ATAG is all about trying to go off and build best practices that allow users to, um, when they're creating content, to follow best practices. How do we use this technology to help um, inform the users about how to make good decisions when they're creating new content? Um, and I'd like to see much more of that I incorporated into to Drupal Core and to have more modules that help support that. Um, there's things like acronyms. Um, acronyms are a real challenge in so many organizations because they're, they become, um, they become it's, it's hard to go off and, and to, to put the time and effort into defining all of your acronyms for all of your web pages. But screen readers have trouble with them and other people have trouble with them. Sometimes organizations are so complicated that there are multiple uses for the same acronym and you need to be careful about which context you're using that particular acronym in. So if there were easier ways to go
and help select and organize acronyms and make it easier for people to go off and when they're creating that content to be able to choose it. Uh, that's something that, that would, would help, I think, everyone. Um, one thing we've done in, that's already in Drupal 8 is uh, the spell check. So we've, we've uh, uh, CK Editor now is, is, it is, is uh, I think in 8.1 or 8.2, um, it's, it's come out so that spell check is enabled. So when you're creating your content, you don't have to worry about your content. User, sorry, content editors will be informed about their, their pages being, being misspelled. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the other thing that in terms of things need to be done, um, WebAIM is this really great organization that, uh, that's being really a leader in accessibility. And they did a, a survey just in January that looked at um, web, the sort of top 100 websites and compared the, those top 100 websites to, the, to a survey that they did uh, five years ago. And they, they determined that web accessibility is, despite the extra interest in accessibility and the, the increase in lawsuits around accessibility, the, the accessibility, the, the number of errors on, on those, those you know, top 100 websites has actually gone up over the last five years, that, that, that websites are generally not more accessible uh, despite the, the, the interest uh, in accessibility and, and the educational efforts that have gone on. Um, and so um, I've already talked about a bunch of the stuff about the application with, with Drupal, but, but just to, to raise a couple other issues. Uh, Drupal 7 is built, sorry, Drupal 8 is built on Drupal 7. Drupal 7 has been tested widely by, by so many organizations, um, the White House and, and uh, you know, many disability organizations like the National Federation of the Blind or AbilityNet or the RNIB. Um, there's a lot of organizations that are using this. Um, the, the other great thing about Drupal is that, that generally things extend core. So the accessibility defaults we've built in uh, core will often be just inherited by the modules and themes that, that are being built with Drupal. So some of the best practices are, are going to be used in your website even if you don't realize that they're there or there are things that, that, you, that you may not be, be even aware of. Um, because that we've, we've made an effort to try and build those a good initial set of defaults. Um, developers also uh, tend to copy uh, other examples, so they'll, they'll go off and, and when you're building a module for Drupal 8, you'll look at uh, existing modules that, that, uh, that are in core and find ways to go off and to, to build on that functionality. And if you've got good accessibility defaults built into core, they're more likely to be extended and, and applied in, in, uh, in new applications or new, new modules and themes as well. Um, and yeah. Um, the, for your own websites, I think that, that it's important to try and, and um, just to keep in mind that if you've already done a Section 508 review, you're going to need to do another review and keep a special attention to those elements that, have, that are not covered in Section 508. Um, it, you know, this is, this is an ongoing issue, like re making sure that you have regular reviews of your website on a, um, at least a quarterly basis. Um, and the, the closer you can tie uh, content creation and, and accessibility reviews together so that people who are creating the content can learn from it, uh, the better it is. Nobody likes to receive, an up to, uh, to see, receive um, information six months after they did work to say that, they, that there's errors in it. You know, it's much easier to go off and to, to give it give them that feedback immediately and get developers and, and, uh, and content editors using tools like the Wave Toolbar to help provide uh, fee immediate feedback. Um, there's tools like Tenon and, and Wave which are, are really useful and there's so many free tools out there uh, that, that help with accessibility and checks with color contrast and it's, they're, they're tools that don't cost a lot and that, that can provide you with a lot of insights into ways to make your site better. Um, the, the, uh, the um, accessibility, the automated tools are really useful and you've got to build those into your, your regular process of evaluating your website and, and don't just use one tool. It's useful to try and get, get used to a couple that you can sort of go back and forth on. Um, but don't rely on them because there's definitely stuff that is, is regularly missed out and um, learning to go off and do a basic navigation with your keyboard is, is really useful. It's probably more useful to learn how to go off and do keyboard navigation well than it is to learn how to use a screen reader. Um, that's, learning how to use a screen reader is a really difficult and complicated thing. Learning how to navigate your website without a mouse is something that, that is, takes very little time to demonstrate and to learn and to get very proficient at. Um, the, the, uh, how many people have accessibility web pages on their, their site? So it's, yeah, a few. I, I used to think that they were pretty useless because um, they didn't really do much because they're usually just like this boilerplate, we are accessible, blah, 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 we meet all requirements, leave us alone. Um, but there's, <laughs> 
Yeah, don't sue us. But there's, there's actually a potentially, uh, there's a lot of ways that you can use that accessibility page to be, be very beneficial. Uh, one of them is that you can um, explain to users what they've done to their, their uh, what you've done to try and make the site accessible. And if you've, you've done things like add area, you can mention that. Um, you can also provide a feedback form to go try and encourage feedback from people with disabilities. If they notice an error, you, how do you make sure that they know that it's a priority and you're going to take this as, as, a, as an important concern? Um, but uh, Lainley uh, Fengold has also said that, that it's uh, useful to link to the accessibility policy on your web page to make sure that you have a, uh, the, the, uh, to make sure that if you have an accessibility pol policy and that you're working with a procurement or you're, you're working to try and define what your goals are as an or organization, that you state that publicly and you have a link on that website so that people can see that you're taking this quite seriously. Um, and Lainey has done some great word on, work on trying to go off and, and, and to, to avoid the, the, the lawsuits and encourage uh, structured negotiation about helping, helping organizations improve accessibility of their sites. Uh, also look at the accessibility tag on Drupal.org, it's quite useful. Um, I generally tend to throw in a slide about free as in kittens, because uh, people think about free as in beer, free as in speech, but I think free as in kittens is more useful because it's sort of like you get a free kitten. If you, if you love it and you want it to go off and to, to uh, not scratch out your eyes, um, then you feed it and you care for it and you nurture it. And so finding ways to go off and engage in the community, finding ways to try and, and improve accessibility. Um, there's, there's one blind accessibility, or one blind student who, uh, uh, Vincenzo Rabano, who in one summer before he started university, he's contributed more individually to Drupal Core uh, than all of the governments and educational institutions, well, you know, almost all of the governments and edu educational institutions in the world combined. Um, there's, not that he's done you know, in, you know, that much, but just the, the, the organizational culture of most educational institutions and most government institutions is not that of ways of, of participating in improving the, the, the Drupal community. Um, Oops. I want to say, just before we get to the questions, there's a couple other accessibility events I wanted to highlight. Uh, one at 1 p.m. today, there's one about seniors and aging. There's the BOF, the accessibility BOF at room 340, in room, I'm uh, sorry, at 345. Uh, there's also tomorrow, um, Beyond Screen Readers, uh, which is actually being led by two of my prior, uh, my previous staff, uh, Everett Zufeld and Aaron Marchak. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what they, they have to say. Um, and we're also having an accessibility sprint at the, uh, the Hilton. Um, so that'll be on Thursday at, um, at 10.45. So are there any questions? Any questions? Any? Yes. Sorry, I don't know if you want to use this. Um, as, a, uh, as a firm that does um, accessibility work and is known for that, um, but knowing that the guidelines themselves are in a gray area and it also requires a cooperation partnership with your clients, how do you as an organization kind of word your scopes and your, your proposals such that you're providing the client with some understanding that you're going to get them more compliant but without exposing yourself to the risk of a suit? Yeah, it's a, it is definitely a challenge to, to deal with that and partly it's, it's um, it's, it's having that conversation in the, in, through the procurement process and the discovery process to see what you're, you're able to go off and to offer. Um, certainly, uh, we, we've seen RFPs where people have asked for AAA compliant websites, and it's like, you know, there's no way that they have the budget for it. Like, you would need to have, like, millions of dollars to have a AAA compliant content management system. It's, it's, a, it's not a trivial ask. Uh, but, but, again, it's, it's trying to raise, raise awareness about the complexity of these issues and, and also that, that the, the content management system is just a tool. Ultimately, you need to be able to have your content editors add information to that. And you may, um, we were doing a presentation with the ACLU um, and, and they, uh, at uh, N10 uh, last month, and it was, it was interesting to, that, to sort of think of, about what was, how the developers and the, the organization reflected on on, what the, on some of their design decisions before it was launched um, and versus after it was launched. Because when you have content authors actually creating the content, they often make different decisions and decide to add more uh, meaning, particularly through images that, that sometimes you're not necessarily seeing as, as important when you're, you're initially creating that, that site. Um, they're just the same as they are uh, for for uh, um, for HTML. The, the trouble is, is that PDF is a. I, I have friends who, who disagree with me on this, but I think that PDFs are are, are really. They they need to be be 
we need to move beyond PDF. Um, they're, they're not a mobile-friendly format. They're not a format that's structured for, uh, f to, to be text-focused. It's very much presentation-focused. Um, and I, I don't think that um, updating uh, the, the uh, PDF, uh, I mean, ultimately organizations should be looking at creating EPUBs and, and, and creating EPUB as the format for, for packaged uh, documentation because um, PDFs are, they have to have the same requirements for perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. Um, but the cost that's required to go off and to create these these um, um, electronic documents, in, like which are essentially like paper facsimiles. Like it's like let's take an eight and a half by eleven sheet of paper and you know create an electronic version of that. Like we're 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 going beyond paper in terms of our concepts and, and our, our inf information. So um, you know anything that's that's dealing with with dynamic content should be sitting on a website or be be done managed through an exposed API. Um, you shouldn't be using a people shouldn't be filling in forms on uh, you know electronic. Um, you know, PDFs. It, it really should be geared towards towards other things. And, and if you're looking to present uh, static content, then then you know, EPUB is a, a much better way to, to, to deal with that. That's 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 just it's, it's encapsulated HTML, so it's much uh, simpler and organized to test and to, to build towards standards that that screen readers and others can use. There you go. That was an easy question. <laughs> The, the, I mean, there are efforts to try and do this. The, um, um, there was uh, um, uh, Jesse Beach and and uh, and Kevin, I forgot Kevin's last name, worked with the Quail API to try and and uh, use that uh, open source accessibility framework to try and and test core on a regular basis. And there were test swarms that that were actively evaluating the number of accessibility problems that were were part of of, uh, of core. And I think that that's. That's certainly an interesting way to go. I, I don't think that Quail is being uh, formally supported at the moment, uh, so there's questions about that. But I also know that it's being uh, incorporated into CK Editor, so um, th there might be some additional life afterwards within that particular library or another one. Um, but there, there are uh, testing frameworks to go off and to incorporate uh, tools like Tenon is, is, is built so that it can quite easily go and, and, and crawl a website and, and, and manage that. Uh, but it is a real challenge and, and something that um, that the uh, uh, that the you know, one of the other uh, core maintainers is, is definitely keen on trying to go off and, and to, to find ways to incorporate that in. Um, I don't have enough background to sort of drive that, but I I, uh, I definitely see that that would be a really critical piece, even just to count the number of errors that are available and to, to see if if with each individual patch are those those errors increasing or decreasing. Um, uh, you know, having having that automated structure would would be helpful for both the for, for Drupal core moving ahead, but also for individual websites, if there's ways to, uh, when you're creating your Drupal build, to, 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 ha to have that as, as a part of your, your ongoing development and testing. Okay. Yeah. Th that being said, the, um, the, the government digital services in the, U uh, the UK went and, and did an evaluation of automated tests versus manual tests, and, and they, um, they ran a bunch of different websites through, through this, and I think it was, um, Automated tests only caught 40% of the errors, the accessibility errors in, in, in their websites that they were testing it with. So it's, you know, automated testing is definitely critical, but it can't be relied on. So you need to have that, that broader understanding of manual testing to, to be able to resolve issues. Yeah. 
it, it is a real trick to go off and to, to, to set up all text correctly. Um, so all text is not needed on decorative images. Um, but how do you define a decorative image? And how do you define conveying images? Uh, what meaning is conveyed through an image? So it's, it's certainly really clear if you've got you know, a bullet that you're, you're putting in the front of, of, a, uh, of some uh, bullet points. If you've got some, some uh, nice little artistic CSS or a font icon or something that you're using, that doesn't convey any meaning. Everyone knows what that, that is. Um, however, there's other cases where that same image might be used for navigation or there might be um, where, it's, where, it's, where it's not uh, clearly a, a, a space where you would, would uh, or where meaning is being conveyed and where, where people need to, to, to click on that. Um, other, other areas, like um, if you, uh, one of the ones we came up with in the issue queue is um, if you have multiple images that are repeated, let's say you, you really, really love something and you put like, you find a heart image and you repeat it five times over, you're not going to write heart, 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 heart on each image. You're going to want to be able to say hearts. And so that, that you know, that, that is, is clear and, then, and to make sure that every other heart that beyond that first one is, is done with a, a null alt text. So alt equals uh, quote, quote, so that, that screen readers know to ignore that text. Um, but, there, but there are other times where, where images um, do convey meaning or convey feeling. And, and I think that, that uh, particularly if it's related to the context of the page or the context of the story, uh, sometimes there's hero messages, especially that are, that, that have, have weight to them, that, that provide that context that users are, are reading. And often those are done with, with background images that are uh, not easy to go off and provide alt text to. If, you're done, if you've got a CSS background image that's, that's being used to provide that full width uh, image on the, on the back. Um, in many cases, those actually should have alt text because um, they, they are providing meaning to other people. Because you know, if you see Donald Trump on, on the cover of, a, of a, um, an article, that, that conveys something. Just as if you have a rainbow flag, it conveys something, right? It's not, it's not just a, it's not like a bullet point, but, uh, but there, there are judgment calls that people need to, to make and, and, uh, and, and be clear about what the distinction is within your organization. Does that answer? Yeah. I would tend to go off and, and, and to include it because it is providing some context about what is being, being included. Um, you don't need to go into a lot of depth. I mean, these are supposed to be short summaries of what, what is the meaning that's conveyed. So, you know, the reason that that image was, was added was because it's, maybe it's on a student page or maybe it's on an application or an admission page. So just to give somebody who's blind uh, some more context around, uh, around the, the page and what's being, being seen because um, they can see that the, there's an image there. Um, but it, it's, uh, but it, it does come down to a, to a judgment call in many cases as to whether or not this is, you know, like if you have a fern in the corner of your page, like that's not something that's going to be all that useful. Um, but if you have two ferns, then suddenly, and if it's in, in context to like the, the show between two ferns, like you might want to, like that, that has, has meaning where one fern might not, right? So it, it's, it's contextual. Yeah. Any other questions? We're close to the end. Uh, for those sites who have been taken to court and been sued, are they usually settling to, I mean, what's the motivation? Is it, is it purely to make money off of sites that are accessible? Is it to change? Uh, yeah. I'm just curious about that. I, I think that, that the, it does depend. I think there are uh, organizations um, that are doing this for, for sites where they do actually want to have change. And that there's also, you know, law firms that are seeing this as a great way to go off and to make some money, right? And, and so it's, it's a, you know, there are the, the gold diggers out there that will always, will always be present when there's an opportunity like this. Uh, but I don't know that there's been any, any sort of way to evaluate the, the number of court cases. And, and some of them aren't public. So uh, Carl Groves has a list of court cases that he knows about that's being maintained on GitHub. Uh, but that, that really needs to have some more definition for, for, the, uh, uh, for 2016 and 2017. So, yeah. And last question? Just a quick question about how you are you approaching the read more needs? Because right. there are many design comps that I get where there are a title with a link that has a read more. That has, sorry, there's a which that has a read more? Uh, listing of content that right. is a title with a link on it, like an H2 with a link to the content, and then the design requires a read more below. So 
right. It, it's a, it is one of these things where, where you, you still, like, because, because of how, how blind users navigate the web, if you have a link, you should also include that, that full title because they're going to be, even if you're repeating the link to the same location, um, if you have one link that says, um, you know, uh, you know, article about X, and then then you've got some other links in the, in the blurb that's 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 included in it, and then you have a read more link without the context. It's, it's something that that you can uh, you can get lost in. Um, so I, I would say that it, it because they a lot of times when screen readers are trying to navigate through the web, they will they will ask for a list of all of the links and just have that read out to them one after the other. So it's not necessarily reading it in context as you and I would be reading the page. They just get the links in, in you know on their own. So you know you might have three or four read mores you know right next to each other. So depending how that's structured. So okay. Thank you.